Hey brothers and sisters, now I'm sure you've been confused why I went live, I went off, I went live off. Just imagine my internet was going on and off uh, for almost 20 minutes, 30 minutes I was trying to go live but I could not be able to. But I know God always has uh, his reasons. Maybe he wanted me to record this video because <laughs> the moment I record the videos I always post one copy uh, on Facebook and uh Sometimes I also post on BitChute and other places. Maybe you wanted me to record so that I can post. Sometimes when I go live, I don't uh, post another copy. So anyway, God is a God of uh, many things. So today I want to speak about um, how can you be sure that your future sins are uh, forgiven? And are they really forgiven your future sins? Because this has been a big debate between Christians. Some people say, uh, no, my future sins are not forgiven. Others, they say, no, 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 they are forgiven. And this has been a, a cause of turmoil between Christians. Some are saying you can lose your salvation if you keep on doing what is wrong because your future sins are not forgiven. Others, they are saying, no, 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 everything is complete. And I believe those who say that uh, you're forgiven completely, those are the people who believe in grace because grace is literally getting what you don't deserve. And uh, we understand that when we accept Jesus as our Savior, God for sure does forgive all our sins, past, present, and future. This is something that you have to ponder and realize and put it in mind. This statement is absolutely 100% biblical. But we must be very careful about what uh, it it means exactly. All right, because if you don't take it keenly, you might end up misquoting or misinterpreting and just saying, "Yeah, because I'm forgiven completely, then I can go back to doing my wicked things." There are consequences, of course, but one thing you have to understand is that according to salvation, on the angle of salvation. You are saved once and your sins are forgiven once. All right. Now, let me just show you something here. Now, look at this verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 uh, downwards. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. The gospel means the good news, which I preached unto you. Paul has been preaching to us about the good news. He had been preaching to uh, the saints about this good news. Over the times which also you have received how did they receive this good news by faith the Bible says without faith it is impossible to to please God and for you to be able to be saved you need to have faith so you receive things from God by faith okay and wherein you stand so you're not standing in anything else you're standing on the gospel you're standing on this good news that I'm about to tell you here that Paul has written to us here. That is what you're standing on for your salvation. You're not standing on anything else. And by which also you're saved. What, does, what saves you? It is the gospel. It is the good news which saves you. So knowing the good news. That will be a fact that you're saved. Because the Bible says you have to come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved. So once you know this good news then now absolutely immediately you are saved because you are saved by this news by this good news this gospel this information what saves you is the information that you know because there's something you need to know for you to be saved are we going together if you keep in memory what i preached unto you unless you have believed in vain how can you keep something in memory when you hear something you understand it and then it goes from your mind to your heart. The only way you can digest information to your heart is if you understand it. And how can you understand it? You can understand first after hearing it and then, you know, putting it in mind. You understand. It's like you digest it in mind and you ask yourself, so this is what happened. This is really true. This went like this. You, you know, you, you ask yourself a few questions. You dig deep. You test. You prove. And once you understand, then it goes from your mind to your heart. And it's like, I believe that memories are kept in the heart. They're not kept in the mind. You keep memories in the heart. You love someone from the heart. 
Most of the things that are close to you, they are in your heart. They are not in your mind. They are in your heart. All right? Unless you have believed in vain. Believing in vain means just you put it in your mind for two, three minutes and voila, it evaporated. Look at this. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. There is something that Paul had received. And he received this in Galatians chapter 1 verse 11 and 12. Where he said that the gospel that I preach is not after man. Neither was I given it by man. But it was a revelation by Jesus Christ himself. So Paul says this is not a manly gospel. This is not a manly good news. It is Jesus who revealed it unto me. And he gave it to me. And that's why Paul says I am delivering to you first that which I also received. Remember Paul went in the desert, uh, to the deserts of Arabia for three years where Jesus taught him the gospel. He revealed to him the mystery of the gospel which was not known. Nobody knew that uh, the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus would give people salvation. You understand this? So this one was given to the Apostle Paul and Paul says follow me for I follow Christ. Listen to what I'm telling you. Because this is exactly from the mouth of Jesus who revealed it unto me. You see the point? For I deliver unto you first that which I also received. And then here comes the main message. It is how, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. How Jesus died, that is where the whole gospel is how jesus died so unless you're using a, a good bible king james bible this word you'll never see it how jesus died because this one word how it means everything it literally means everything if you don't know how jesus died then how can you be saved so let's evaluate how did jesus die jesus died by shedding his blood Jesus died by shedding his blood. Why? The Bible tells us why he had to shed his blood. Hebrews 9 verse 22. It tells us the reason why Jesus had to shed his blood. I always repeat, if Jesus died of any other thing apart from shedding his blood, then there is no remission. There is no forgiveness. Look at this. And almost all things are, are by the law purged with blood. There has to be blood shed for something to be uh, 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 to be verified and without shedding of blood is no remission there is no forgiveness of any sin unless there is shedding of blood all right that's why jesus had to shed his blood the next question that you definitely will ask to understand how jesus died and why he had to shed his blood is you ask yourself why blood what was so important that Jesus had to shed his blood. Because if blood is really important. Uh, if blood is so important like this. Then why did Jesus. What is so important. What, what is there in that blood. What is there in that blood that Jesus had to shed it. The Bible tells us in the book of Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. You see why Jesus had to shed blood. Because the life is in the blood the life is in the blood all right and i've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls remember jesus is the great high priest and he took his blood to the altar in heaven and he poured it there at the mercy seat in heaven for what to atone for your sin and for my sin for it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul if you need any atonement for your soul, then blood has to be shed. This is why Jesus had to shed his blood. And this is why you have to understand how Jesus died. And after you understand how Jesus died, then now that information will never come out of your mind. Whether you want it or you don't want it, that is information which has come into your mind. It has regenerated you. It has made you new. It has made you to understand that man... I didn't know it was like this. I could have shed my own blood. Because the Bible tells us the wages of sin is death. So 
I had to shed my blood, but Jesus said, no, 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 I'm going to, to shed mine for you. So you just keep calm, relax, let me shed my blood for you. Are you seeing the point here? All right. Now, having said that, having said that, we understand that Jesus died for all our sins. He did not die for some sins. Jesus didn't die for uh, some sins and left others. Hebrews 10.10. 10. Let's, let's look at this verse. The Bible says, By the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. Jesus offered himself once for all. He did not offer himself over and over, just like uh, the way the priests, especially Catholic priests and Orthodox and all these others, they, they stand every day, they are trying to offer, again, sacrifices. Those things that they, 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 they give all the time. It's like you're trying to re-crucify again Christ there. The Bible says, and every priest standard daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. All right. So now this is something that you have to understand that Jesus offered himself once for everyone and for all. Just like uh, through the sin of one man, Adam, we all became sinners. The same way through the justification of one man, Jesus, then everybody is made perfect. All we need to do is believe in him, be born in him. We are told that we have to be born again. Through Adam, we were born into this world. In the flesh, water broke. We were born of water. But then now, when you believe, you hear this message of the gospel, and you understand it, and you believe it, then you are born of the Spirit. Because the way you can be born of the Spirit is by faith. And faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Because you are not there to see Jesus at the cross. Then you have to hear what really happened to him. And hear it. And hear it. And hear it. And understand faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And after you hear, now you understand. And once you understand, then now... You have received that by faith. So salvation is as simple as it, 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 it means. All right. Let me show you. So First John uh, chapter 2 verse 22. Look at this. Jesus died once. He's not going to die over and over again. Who is a liar but he that denied that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. So when you see somebody denying that Jesus is the Savior, is the Christ, is the anointed one, who came in the flesh and he died for us once, then that person is an Antichrist. Because he is trying to say that it is not Jesus did not give the ultimate sacrifice, that he gave some sacrifice and then another will come like uh, the way they say Mohammed is the last prophet. Oh, he came after Jesus. He came and gave his own verdict. And then we have another from Buddha side, another one from this side, another one from another false uh, religion out there. Who will say, all these are just prophets and they came in different times just to give their stories. But they, they don't want to approve that Jesus is the Christ, is the anointed one. He is the, not an anointed one but the anointed one christ means anointed one so when you see people denying this and they are saying that he is not forgiven you all your sins at once then those are antichrist or maybe they don't really understand all right they don't really understand so it is really absolutely 100 percent biblical to say that our salvation is secure in christ because the bible has told us so in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 13. All right? Ephesians 1, verse uh, 13. Look at what the Bible says. We are secured. In whom also you trusted, 
uh, in whom you also trusted. Okay, you trust after something happens. You cannot trust someone until you have been with them, you have understood them, you have studied them, you have spent some time with them. You cannot trust them. You can't trust me unless you have heard me over and over and understood me. So in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth. You heard the word of truth, which is that word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. You hear that gospel. Hmm. Okay, so this is how Jesus died, right? He shed his blood, right? You hear, you understand. And after that you believed, you have heard, you have understood, then you have trusted or you have believed. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Now, after you have heard and you believe, then something happens immediately. You are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Immediately you get sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Why of promise? Because Jesus promised us. He told his disciples, I'm leaving, but I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to send you a helper, the Holy Spirit, who is going to abide with you forever. He's going to be with you. He's going to indwell you. He'll, he'll never leave you. Until I come back, until the last day, the day of redemption. Look at this. You are sealed. Do you know something which is sealed? How you seal something? The way you seal an envelope and you, 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 you put some saliva and you there and you seal it and you say, nobody's going to open this. Here in Africa, when you are sending letters, you, you, you get hold of a, you get hold of a, uh, 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 what do we call it? An envelope. And after you have put everything here, you seal it like that. And then you put it like this. And then you say, nobody's going to open that envelope until a certain day. It will, all these envelopes will be opened on Saturday. It is sealed. So if it is sealed, then who is going to open? Remember the Bible says, I am the one who opens and nobody closes. I'm the one who closes and nobody opens. So if the Holy Spirit has been sealed inside you, then who is that person trying to say that he can open what God has sealed? When God sealed, the Bible says, the time of Noah, Noah and his family got into the ark and God shut them in. And after the ark was shut, there was nobody to open it. They cried, wailed. I'm sure there were people who are really strong with uh, with the uh, axes and and um, and um, maybe things which could you know open those locks and seals and i'm sure even noah maybe probably had the cries and he was merciful and maybe tried to open but he could not open because once god has closed nobody can open so when the holy spirit is sealed inside you then nobody can open and this Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance, is the assurance of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession and to the praise of his glory. What is the purchased possession? What has been purchased after you've gotten saved? It is your soul and your spirit. Your soul which is eternal and your spirit which was dead, it has been brought alive. Now you have the Holy Spirit which has replaced your old spirit which had died you have the spirit of god which has regenerated you you see the point and the same holy spirit inside you will quicken now finally he will change your mortal body into immortal body on the day of redemption and we are told that he cannot live until the day of redemption let me show you ephesians chapter 4 verse 30 this holy spirit inside you it doesn't matter what has happened, what you've done, what you've gone through. He will never leave you. Look at what the Bible says. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of when? Until you sin? He's sealed until you've done something wrong, until you've abused someone, now the Holy Spirit leaves? No. You are sealed unto the day of redemption. Until the day of redemption. That's the time that the Holy Spirit has been sealed. And the day of redemption is the day of the rapture. The day that we are changed. We are transformed. 
in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trump, we are going to be transformed. That is a time that the Holy Spirit has been, has been sealed up to. And after we get new bodies, now we purely don't, uh, we cannot do anything wrong anymore. Because this, this body keeps on making us sin over and over again. And remember, my friends, once you're saved, something has happened. There is a spiritual circumcision. Colossians chapter 1 verse 11. Is it 1 or 2? Chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Verse, uh, actually, I'll start verse 10. Mm, no, no, verse 11 is okay. The Bible says, In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. You are cut off. You are circumcised with the circumcision. You know, is a spiritual circumcision. You are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. By the circumcision of Christ. Let me show you an example here. This small booklet of mine, it's, it's one like this, right? But then there is a circumcision that we do. I've done a, a little circumcision here. Is literally I've cut it off and separated two sides. So this one is the soul and the spirit. And this one here, it is the flesh. So the flesh is different from the soul and the spirit. This one wants to do wrong. This one wants to do right. No wonder the Bible says, walk in the spirit so that you don't fulfill the desires of the flesh. The flesh and the spirit, they struggle between one another. The flesh wants you to do sinful things. The spirit does not want you to do sinful things. That's why a Christian can never enjoy sin. When he's trying to please the flesh, the spirit is telling you, come on, come on, you're saved. Just do what is right. Because the grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness. When you're trying to be ungodly, the Spirit of God is telling you, no, this is not right. He's not condemning you, but he's teaching you because now he's inside us. He's our teacher. You see the point? So now, once you have been circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, God puts off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism. Wherein also you are risen with him through the faith in the operation of God. Who has raised him from the dead. It's like you, you accept that you died with Christ and you rose with him. Now you are a new creature. You are purely a new creature in Christ Jesus. And if you are a new creature, then the old creature is gone. How can you be able to... Do things like the old creature and your new. Uh, let, let me show you something here. Uh, look at this verse. I was trying to check this verse. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. Look at what the Bible says here. This is something for you to understand. Now you have died with Christ and you have risen with him. Okay. Then the Bible says here in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Now listen, so if you, it's appointed for you to die once, and after this judgment, and we see that you have died with Christ and risen with Christ, so what does this tell you? That now there is no more death for you. You have already died and risen up with Christ. So somebody is trying to tell you that you can lose your salvation, that God has not forgiven your future sins, then he's trying to tell you that you can die the second time. The second time. Because you died with Christ and you rose with him. Are <laughs> you seeing the point? So it's like um, you have done an outside court agreement. That's why Christians, they don't die. Believers, they don't die. What happens is that we hear that they are not dead. They are asleep. They only sleep. But if you're not saved, you're going to die for sure. You'll have the second death. But Christians, once they, they have died, that's it. 
Once you died with Christ, that's it. Now you'll only sleep and wake up. Because now the one who lives in you, it is no longer you. The old you died at the cross. You get the point? The old you died at the cross. Now the one who lives in you, it is Christ. And your life is hidden by God in Christ Jesus in heaven. That's what the Bible tells us. So our salvation is secure in Christ Jesus. And those who are justified will be glorified. Anybody who is justified shall be glorified. Let me show you this. In the book of Romans chapter 8 verse, um, verse 30. The Bible tells us those who are, who are justified, they will be glorified. Anybody. Look at this. Moreover whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. You see there is a, there's, there's a continuation here. God predestinated you for salvation. All right, he called you by name and you heard him. Why did you hear him? Because you're his sheep. Now, this thing of predestination has a lot of confusion. Let me let me just uh, uh, address this. I know I've addressed it in another video, but let me just address it again. In this world, not everybody is human. As a matter of fact, so many are not human. Remember, Satan has his seed, and Satan has been creating his seed over and over again. Remember the Bible said that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and principalities and powers in high places. So if we wrestle not against flesh and blood, have you ever looked at some leaders, some celebrities, some evil people in the world, and you ask yourself, is this person really a human? Remember, Satan has his own seed also. Just the same way Jesus was from the seed of God. He was fully God and fully man. So this one tells us that Satan also has created his own seed. Remember the Bible says in the book of Genesis that the seed of the woman will crush the seed of the serpent. So the woman is going to create a body. A body will be prepared for Jesus to come in. The Bible says a body was prepared for me. So that body which came alive, which became a human being, that flesh, that Jesus, he, he, he's, the Bible says that he will crush the seed of the serpent. Meaning there is also another body which will be prepared for the serpent. I don't know if you're getting the point. So Satan also has his own team to prepare him a body as well to dwell in that's why jesus was fully having the mind of god satan has his own people that he has prepared and fixed who have purely the mind of satan <clears throat> you look at some very very evil kind of people and you ask yourself how come these people are so evil like this there is a seed and those people they can never hear the voice of god why because some of them they are not they are not human you've seen satan creating robotic people clones and all those kind of things do you want to tell me that a robot can be saved that a clone can be saved does it have a soul so anyway i don't want to get deeper into that you can check my other video on uh, are we all humans and you can be able to understand more but the bible already tells us because we are humans Everybody who is human has been predestinated for salvation. But those who are not, angels cannot be saved, dogs cannot be saved, animals can be saved. Satan cannot be saved. So if you are you're, 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 you're the seed of the devil, then you, even this message you cannot understand it because it's not meant for you. Humans have like a software inside them which connects them with God. And every time you feel God is, God is, is speaking to you. And you can hear him. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. They hear, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they know me. 
it doesn't mean that all sheep are going to follow uh, the, the shepherd. No, some will run away. But all of them, they'll definitely hear the voice of the shepherd. So he has predestinated us. And he called us. And when he calls you and you answer, then he is going to justify you. He's going to change you and make you different. He's going to make you uh, 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 sinless. And then after he has made you sinless, he has purchased your soul and spirit, the purchased possession, then he's going to glorify your mortal body. You see the point here? All right. So we should not use the idea that my future sins are forgiven to imply that once we have received Christ as Savior, we have no more need to ask for forgiveness. This one I want to tell you because there are those who think that now that I'm saved and I can't lose my salvation, then I never want to tell God sorry for anything. Let me ask you a simple question. You, uh, a, a simple question. When you are born into a family, do you find it sometime that uh, you mess up with your father or mother? You do something that they don't like? Does it mean that the moment you poured some milk on the sofa and you're a child, now that was the end of you and your father? He told you, no, 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 you're no longer my child. You're no longer my son, my daughter. Go away, I don't know you. Are you a member of that family because you're doing good? Or are you a member of that family based on birth? It is based on birth. You are born in the flesh. You are born. Water broke. And you are born into that family. Whether they like it or not, whether you're good or bad, those are your parents. And they'll never deny you. Even if you deny them, they'll never deny you. And even if you die in crime, you die, you're shot by the police, they're the ones who are going to bury you, right? But now, what happens when you mess up your father or your mother at home? You do something wrong. You go to them and tell them, Dad, I'm sorry for what I did yesterday. I was just a bit stupid. I overreacted over this and that. And I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Now, this one is to make right your relationship between you and your parents. Okay? The same way with God. The same way with God. We need to ask for forgiveness for a good relationship between us and God. In other words, we must distinguish between forgiveness regarding our eternal salvation and forgiveness regarding our day-to-day -day fellowship with God. Consider a few passages that I'm going to give you, all right, which point our need for forgiveness even after we are saved. Look at the, the Bible in the book uh, in the book of first john first john 1 verse 8 we can read to 10 look at this i want to show you that we still need to ask for forgiveness for relationship purposes if we say that we have no sin this is talking to believers we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us meaning the people who have the truth who is the truth christ jesus so if Jesus is in you and you start saying, I have no sin, then you deceive yourself. So does it mean that Jesus came in but you are still sinful? Well, our flesh can sin. But our new creature, soul and spirit, cannot sin. This one is pure, holy. It is sinless. This other one can still sin. It is still not redeemed until the day of redemption. So one is waiting, the flesh is waiting to be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. When we shall be changed and given new bodies. So the flesh still sins. The Bible tells us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins. Alright? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So meaning if we 
we are sure that the word of God is in us, then you cannot say you're not a, 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 a sinner, you have, you have no sin, that your flesh has no sin, because you'll get outside there, you will last over something, you will say something which is bad, you will lie to someone, you will do this, you will do that. It, many a times that we find ourselves, we do wrong things left, right and center. And that one shows that for sure we, we are human beings and at some point we, we find ourselves sinning in the flesh. But our new creature has already been purchased. It cannot sin because we are the seed of God. I don't know if... Let me show you something. Look at this. 1 John 3, 9. 1 John Three, verse nine. That one, this one, the first John one eight. I've shown you that you still sin in the flesh. But look at this: whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. This one is talking about the new creature cannot commit sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Now you're born in the spirit. Once your spirit and soul is born again it cannot sin you see you have to understand the two the distinction unless you understand second Col uh, colossians chapter 2 verse 11 to 12 where we have been circumcised we have been cut off the body of the sins of the flesh is set apart and the others is set apart you cannot understand this whole concept that's why it's really important to understand this whoever is born of god does not commit sin because the seed for his seed, the seed of God remains in him. Now, the seed of God, the moment you believed, the Holy Spirit do, uh, indwells you. And he plants the seed of God, the desire of God. You cannot, you cannot change your mind from something that you have understood and believed. You have understood and believed something. You know you have understood, you have believed that fire is hot. There's no way you can wake up and say, no, fire is not hot. You will just say it, but you know that this fire is hot. And even if you're touching it, you'll touch it and just... How many people have fallen uh, at the middle of the ocean? Very few. They have fallen in there and they had to swim to the shore. But how comes when you, like, like here in Mombasa, I'm, I'm at the coastal town, most of the time when people go deeper into the ocean, even if they have never been left there and uh, try to swim out or something, they know that it's dangerous. They say, well, I, 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 I hope the ship is fine. I hope the yacht is good because here we are really deep and I know. That I can die here. Who told you you can die there and you have never? Have you ever died? Why do people fear death and they have never died? Because they have heard it. They have understood it. They have listened to stories. They have read books. They have heard news about people dying and they have never come back. And because of this understanding, they fear. You get the point? They have never died. Nobody has ever died and come and told us, okay, it's like this. I see there are people who say on YouTube, but who, who, who knows that they're saying the truth or not. I'm not denying them or I'm neither am I acknowledging them that, but have you died and come back to, to tell your story? And how comes you understand? It is because you have heard and heard and heard and you know and something you have heard, it has come from your mind to your heart. You have believed it, that there is life after death. You have believed that there is heaven, there is hell. Have you ever seen it? No. You believe that there is God. Have you seen him? No. You believe that Jesus loves you. Have you seen Jesus face to face? No. You have read the books. You have read the Bible. That there was a man called Jesus who died for us. You see, once you hear this, faith comes by hearing, hearing, hearing. Now you start believing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And the more you hear, the more you believe, the more it comes naturally you believe. So unless you hear the word of God, you can never believe. Salvation does not come by laying of hands, does not come by baptism, 
does not come by saying the sinner's prayer, does not come by doing all these things, going to church, being a good person, giving tithes, giving offerings. Salvation does not come by helping the poor. Salvation does not come by just doing simply good. You can do good and go to hell. Salvation comes from a point of understanding. You understand what Jesus did for you, how he died for your sins. He was buried and rose again, according to the scriptures, how he died shedding his blood. You see the connection once again. So, like I've told you, whosoever is born of God does not do what? Does not commit sin. All right? So, let's go back again to understanding this fact of the relationship. All right? First John, again, I go back to John, chapter 2, verse 1. It tells us now the relationship angle between us and God as a father. All right? Look at this. My little children, these things write I unto you, that you see not. You see, this God is talking to his children. His children, you are a child of God. You are already saved. You are a born again Christian, a born again believer. But then God is saying, my little children, these things I write unto you that you see not. Hmm. How can you sin and you're already a believer? You're sinning in the angle of the flesh. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. You're sinning. You've done something wrong. We have an advocate. Why is Jesus our advocate? Because he's the mediator between man and God. The man Jesus, he's our mediator. We no longer have priests now mediating between us and God. Now, the Bible says back in the days, God spoke to us through the prophets and the law and the prophets and, and, and all that. But now he speaks to us through his son, Jesus, who is inside us. The spirit of Christ is in us. So he's our advocate between us and the father. And he's the propitiation for our sins, you see? And not for ours only, not for ours who are already believers. He's not propitiating for our sins only, but uh, also for the sins of the whole world. They also want to get saved. He is still the one who can propitiate for them. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandment. How can you know that this is my father? If is your father then you listen to him he tells you uh, get me a glass of water you will go and pick him a glass of water because he's your father you respect him you love him but if he's not your father then you can hear him saying give me a glass of water and you're just passing by you're doing your own things you 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 don't really care much you're passing on and you're doing your own things are you seeing the point here so it's really, 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 really important to put this in mind. To put this in mind. Alright? So in both the verses that I've shown you, talking about us and sin and, and all that, the two passages, the Apostle John teaches that Christians still sin in the flesh, in the body. And that when we do sin, when we do sin, God stands ready to forgive when we confess the sin to the Lord. All right? And the forgiveness is contingent upon the confession. Sin does not have to continue to separate us from the fellowship of between us and the Father. Jesus had paid, has paid already for the, the main sin, which is for salvation of our soul. But now, there are these other small, small things which are giving us bad reputation with the father and until those small small sins are dealt with they remain a wedge between us it's like they're bringing a bridge between us and confess sin in a in in a believer's life is a serious matter to god when you keep on making your father angry all the time he's angry with you uh, you did not wash the dishes He's angry with you, you are beating another child outside there. He's angry with you, you broke the remote. He's angry with you. So it's not good. It's going to be detrimental to 
your relationship between you and your father. Yes, he can never deny you because you are his son or his daughter. But you're going to have a very bad relationship. So many things you will miss. He's buying all the other children some nice new clothes. He's not going to buy for you. He's not going to give you some things because he know you you you're full of wastage. He will say you're my son, but I cannot give you the car keys because I know you're going to you're going to cause an accident. But if you're responsible, you're you're deserving. You're someone who wants to do what is right, then he's going to give you all these things because they belong to you. You're responsible. You get the point? So, any sin which you do in the flesh, it affects our relationship with the Father. Let me show you this. In the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, I want you to look at this. The Bible says, Likewise you husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Uh, likewise you husbands, dwell with them, talking about dwell with your, 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 your wives, according to knowledge, okay? Giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. Sometimes we have our prayers hindered because we treat people badly. You treat others badly. If, if uh, you're in a family and you're one of the sons treating another son badly, your father will be like, no, don't tell me that. You, you have to love your brother. I give you a cake. Give some, something to your brother. Don't always be selfish. Give something to your sister. Stop beating your brother, your sister, your members of the same family. And if you continue being abusive and, and doing wrong things to other family members, then uh, what's going to happen is that the father will not be happy with you and is going to hinder some things from you. Some fruits, some nice goodies that he was to give you. He is going to hinder them and is going to say, no, 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 I'm not going to do this to you. Not that I hate you, but I want to give you a lesson. All right? Look at also this Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, verse 15. Galatians 5, 15. It says, But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed of one another. Do you know you can be consumed of one another? You bite, you devour one another in the family of God. You keep on fighting wrangles here, like the wrangles we always see in the churches. People fighting over money, people fighting over leadership, people fighting over who is, good, who is bigger than who, where. Do you remember when that woman, I believe it is a woman who came to Jesus and said, uh, Master, would you allow that my two sons uh, sit next to you in, in the kingdom? Is it a woman or is it the, the disciples? Maybe some of them said, who, who is going to sit near or something like that. I don't remember the story. And Jesus said, the greatest one is, will be the servant one. If, if you want to serve others, you're going to be the greatest in the kingdom. It's not about me giving you positions. It's about you serving, being good to others, not devouring one another, not biting one another, not fighting others, but doing what is right. And when you do what is right, then automatically God is going to do um, uh, to, to, to reward you according to your deeds. This is where now the judgment seat of Christ is, comes, comes in. That's the day that we're going to sit down and then God is going to tell us, you did this, and you did this. You're a good person. Here are the rewards. And another Christian believer there, he'll be in heaven and he'll be told, you are biting your brothers. You, you, you. It was all sure for you. Yes, you're in heaven. You cannot lose heaven. It's your home. But you have no reward. Your reward has gone through fire and it has you know, been destroyed because it was all fake. You gave to the poor but you only wanted to be seen. 
That's why the Bible says, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Because the flesh lasteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. You see, they are fighting. And these are contrary one to another so that you cannot do things that you would. You see, they are fighting, fighting, fighting. The spirit and the the spirit and the flesh, they are always fighting. All right? And when you continue doing what is wrong, the Bible says even your physical health can be messed up with. Look at the Bible in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 29. All right? We can read to 30. That's why you need forgiveness for the things you do in the flesh. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. You see, there are some things that you eat or drink unworthily. Let's say, for example, you wake up and you're drinking yourself dead, falling in the streets. You cannot even look at the, 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 the um, you cannot even see the, the roadside. What if you're hit by the car? And you die. Now, is God going to say, no, no, that, that one cannot be hit by the car because he's a Christian. No, you'll be hit and you die. Yes, you'll go to heaven, but you've lost your rewards. Maybe the time that you could have stayed here, you could have gained so many rewards later. But you've died early death. So you don't have any more rewards after the ones that you accumulated. And you could have stayed maybe 70 years. You stayed 40 years or 30 years. Because of your sins. He that eateth and drinketh unworthily. Eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. Not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you. And many sleep. Many die. Sleeping here means many die. You know Christians don't die. They sleep. Because of them eating and drinking unworthily. There are those people who wake up and they, they drink themselves until they get liver cirrhosis. They get this and that. They, others, they are obese. They eat so much. You eat and eat and eat until you die. Have you seen people who love fast foods? And they are Christians. And they eat too much. I'm not saying eating a fast food is bad. But don't be glutton. Don't overdo things. Don't overeat things or over drink things or overdo things be moderate god is a god of order god is a god of plan did you ever hear one place where jesus was drunkard no but he drank definitely didn't drink water only he ate and drank with sinners so he was sitting with them not drinking water but drinking wine drinking these eating with them that's why they say the bible in the book of matthew says that John the Baptist came without eating or drinking. They called him uh, a witch, something like that. And Jesus came drinking and eating and they called him a drunkard and a, a wine bubbler and, and a glutton. Why were they calling him that? Because they don't understand. But Je Jesus, he, was he a glutton? No. Was he a, a drunkard? No. He was moderate in everything that he was doing. But those who keep on eating and drinking unworthily, they eat and drink to damnation. Alright? So sins can be in so many ways. Let me show you also one in, in the book of James. Uh, chapter 5 verse uh, 16. Look at this. So I'm trying to separate the flesh and the spirit so that you can understand. The Bible says confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So confess your faults to one another. This means that believers are false. They have mistakes. They have sins. And these sins are fleshly sins, not spiritual sins. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Fleshly sins can be healed. Because the effectual fervent prayer uh, prayer of a righteous man you see these are righteous man having faults 
availeth much. All right? This meaning we should not ignore the sins we continue to commit. We should not shrug them off by saying, Jesus already forgave my future sins. We must deal with them. And the Bible already told us how we can deal with them. We are saved by grace through faith. And the moment, the moment uh, we trust in Jesus, we are made right with God. And our sins are completely forgiven. The book of Colossians chapter 2 verse 13 tells us, the moment you believed in Christ, you're completely, completely forgiven. Look at this. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. You see, this is before you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Before you are circumcised, you are dead in your sins. But he has quickened together with him. The moment you died and you rose with Christ, he quickened you together with Jesus Christ, having forgiven you all. Look at this. He's forgiven you how many trespasses? Past only? No. Present only? No. Future only? No. All trespasses. Each and every trespasses. Past, present, and future. He's forgiven you all trespasses. Blotting out. Do you know what is blotting? It's like you're completely rubbing, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Everything which was written against us. You know in your DNA every day, what, whatever you do is recorded. Just the same way it was recorded from Adam and he passed it to all of us. The sin of Adam was written in his DNA over that fruit he ate. And it was passed to all generations. But the only person who blotted out that generational curses, generational sins which was passed to us from Adam. It is Jesus Christ. He washed them. He cleaned our book. He blotted out. Look at this. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Which was contrary to us. There are so many things which were we could have gone to hell my friends. And took it out of the way. Nailing it to the cross. Jesus took out everything that we did wrong. And he nailed it to the cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly. Triumphing over them in it. He spoiled everything. <laughs> what the principalities were waiting. And they said oh. These people they are going to hell with that. <laughs> Jesus came and. He spoiled everything. So right now we, 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 we start our relationship with, with God on a clean slate. A clean slate. Let me show you. In the book of Psalms. Mm, 103 verse 12. Now we are on a clean slate. Nobody can accuse you anymore. Look at this. As far as the east is from the west, so he has, so far, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. My friends, we are starting on a clean note. You've been forgiven. You've been blotted out your sins. Oh, my friends, as far as the east is far from the west, he has removed our transgressions. Like as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him. Because he knows our frame. He knows our problems. And he remembers that we are dust. So we have been changed. Alright? We are starting clean. Let me show you another verse here. Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 5 verse um, 21. This is so amazing, friends. So amazing. For he has made him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin? That you might be made the righteousness of God in him. He made him to be sin for us. Come on, Jesus was not a sinner. But God allowed him to be sin for us. That we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. 
Only can you be called righteous if you're in Christ and Christ is in you. This is a mystery of the indwelling of God. This mystery is huge. All right? If you understand this, you understand that the power of sin has been broken. Power has no more sin over uh, or, or has no, sin has no more power over you. There is no way that sin can take control of you. <laughs> you are saved, sealed, and sanctified. Let me let me let me let me show you this, because you are literally been crucified with Christ, and that's it for you. That's it for you. The book of Romans. Chapter 6, from verse 1, I'm going to read up to verse 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that uh, grace may abound? Should we continue in sin so that grace may abound, may, 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 may be more? Should we? No. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin? We are already dead. We died with Christ and we rose again. How shall we, those who are dead in, uh, to sin, live any longer therein? We live inside the sin again. How can we? It's like knowing you're above the law. The president is above the law and then he takes a machine gun and goes shooting people because he knows I cannot be prosecuted because I'm above the law. People are going to ask him, you're becoming a fool. Knowing that you are above the law does not mean you go shooting people, killing people. So God tells us, now that you are free from sin, should we just continue doing sinful things, lying and... No. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We were baptized into his death. But doesn't mean that baptism, water, gives you salvation. No. You are baptized in the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who indwells unto you. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. Remember, the Bible says that John baptized with water. But there is one who would come who would baptize with the Holy Spirit. So that Holy Spirit, the Bible says with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So that fire is... I wish I explained later on about this fire thing. I don't want to get into so many details. Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit, some, and others with fire. Remember that verse says, that fire is unquenchable. Some will be baptized by fire in hell, where Jesus is going to cast them. So he's going to come doing two baptisms here. One with the Holy Spirit for the righteous and those who have believed in him. And another one will come. They'll be put into fire. Look at this. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the death, dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together like in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. I am crucified with Christ. I, I love a song which sings, I am crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. You see, I am crucified with him. It is no longer I who lives. It is Christ who lives in me. The body of the sin has been destroyed. Therefore, we should not serve sin. It's like we are dead. We're only waiting in these fake bodies that we have, these corruptible bodies, to be given new bodies like the one of Jesus Christ. And voila, we are good. Galatians 2 verse 20. Look at this. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Alright? You no longer live. It is Christ who lives in you. 
So you're dead and your life is hidden in Christ Jesus by God. So how can you lose your salvation? You're a dead man. How can you wake a dead man to pay rent? How can you wake a dead man to tell him, Oh, you have lost your salvation. Uh, your future sins were not forgiven. You dead man. You did not pay tomorrow's bills, dead man. I'm a dead man. So what are you trying to ask a dead man? I'm dead. Furthermore, I can show you where I was buried and rose again. At Calvary, I died. I was buried with Christ. And it is appointed for men to die once and after that judgment. So you want to know about when I, was, when I died 2,000 years ago? So right now, I, my life is hidden in Christ. I'm literally sitting in heavenly places with Christ Jesus right now. And the Bible says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. You see, if righteousness came by the law, Christ is dead in vain. Yet because we are still flawed human living in a, a fallen world, we are still people, flawed human, human beings who are living in a fallen world. We still give in to temptation and, the dam and uh, damage the relationship that we enjoyed with God. And uh, confession of our sin to the Lord means the slate once more, uh, cleans the slate, sorry, once more and restores us to God. And my friends, when we are in Christ, our position as God's children never changes. We are children of God once and for all it never changes but our ability to enjoy a clean conscience a pure heart and the pleasure of our father is sometimes hindered by sins of the flesh consider it this way you're sitting by a window all right and there's sun you're enjoying sun and then all of a sudden somebody comes and puts a uh, uh, what, what do we call it? He, he puts a, mm, 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 what, what do we call this? A curtain between uh, a, 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 a the window. He puts a curtain there and a dark curtain. So that curtain cuts off the sun rays and you no longer can be able to enjoy the sun. So does it mean that the sun is not there? No, the sun is still there, right? Does it mean that you're not here? You're still here, right? But why can't you feel the sun anymore? Because there's something hindering you. Hindering you. Hindering the sun. Connection. That is sin. So sin comes and cuts the much good relationship you have had with the Father. And when you continue doing wrong things, it's like even here on earth, your Father, you continue doing wrong things over and over. He doesn't really want to talk to you. He doesn't want fellowship with you. He just comes and you, hey, dad, it's like, you guys have a good night. He's gone to sleep. Because you know that you have a bad relationship. It's like you're putting a curtain on the window. So sin is like that shade. It's like that curtain. It separates us from God. And it is up to us whether we remain in that darkened condition or not. And confession of sin does lift that curtain out all right it makes us again get the good sun rays that we have had from the father god has not moved the sun has not moved right his warmth has, has not cooled down but our sin has blocked the ability of us to enjoy that sun okay forgiveness of uh, from god is a priceless gift but it came at a great cost to our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, God does not take this one lightly. And the sins of his children uh, will always make our God feel bad at some point. And uh, the only way that he can help us out 
and we are children we are disobedient we are disobedient children if you are a father you are a mother you have children and they are always disobedient to you what do you usually do to them so that you can correct them you chasten them you you beat them a little bit until they come back online because they are your children you cannot throw them away that is exactly what uh, 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 the bible tells us that is what god does to us sometimes you're a believer and uh, you're going through some situations i'm not saying all situations that believers go through uh uh, uh that uh, believers go 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 through they are because of chasti chastisement no sometimes there are just normal situations god uh, taking you through uh, allowing a temptation or something to go to to to, to come to you so that uh, you can gain rewards because the bible says and rejoice when you go through trials and tribulations because great is your reward in heaven but there are sometimes when god allows something also a chastisement to go uh, near you a punishment of some way so that you do what is right remember david when he sinned with barsheba and they got a child the punishment was that that child could not survive no matter how much david loved that baby he could not get it get him back because that was a way of god chastising him chastising him that's a hard word <laughs> Hebrews 12 verse 4 the bible says you have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin your striving is not up to blood like jesus did it is just small small things here you don't have this you don't have that and you know god is trying to rectify you through small small things you have not resisted unto blood that you had to die and you have and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastise, chast, chastaining. Ah, this word is usually very hard for me. Just pardon me what I say. Despite not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Stop feeling bad when God is rectifying you. He is your father, right? Stop feeling bad when he's correcting you as a son, as a daughter. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourges every son whom he receiveth. Why is he scourging you? Why is he hitting you a little bit? Why does he take the road to spare the child? He's taking the road to spare the child because they take away the road and you spoil the child, right? So God is a father. And that's why he does some things. He chastens you when you do sinful things and you're a believer. He scourges every son that he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. All right? You endure and you tell God, God, that one was, God, that, that, that one was huge, but please, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for what I did. God, it's okay. You tell him, God, I'm, I'm sorry. He's dealing with you as a son. For what son is he whom the father chastened not? How can you say you're, this one is my father and he cannot correct you over anything? Alright? Look at this. But if you, if you be without chastisement, uh, chastisement whereof, are all, whereof all are partakers, then you are bastards and no sons. If you do something wrong and you pass and a father is not even looking at you, then you must be a bastard you must be someone that that one is not a fa your father he must be something else because your father will always correct you but if you do something wrong here and you just see a certain man walk around and just he doesn't really care then most probably that is not his child but if he's his child he's going to say come here why did you do that what do you know it's bad get a few punches and Look at what the Bible says in verse 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us. No more fathers here on earth, we have had them, which have always corrected us. And we gave them reverence. Father, it's okay, you have beat me, but it's fine. It's fine. It's okay, you are my dad. I, I respect you. 
I know I did this wrong. Please, Dad, I'm sorry. We, we give them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? Can't you just be sub? God chastises you and you tell him, God, I, I, this one, I understand. I, I know, I understand my mistake. It's, it's okay, I'm your child. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Please help me not to do it again. Look at this. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. Maybe he wanted you to uh, do something. Maybe you, you study, you become a lawyer, and maybe you did not want that. You wanted to become uh, a singer. But your father wanted you to become a lawyer because he's a lawyer, maybe, probably, and that's why he was chastising you. But because it, it was after their own pleasure, they wanted to, you know, to be a, a village hero. You see, my son has achieved these. Like today, uh, uh, results for the primary schools have just been released and they were seeing parents there. They were so happy and raising up their hands and saying, this is my daughter, this is my son. Yeah, and then they're giving interviews on TV and they're saying, yeah, yeah, he's been really a good person. I was teaching him and he was always listening. When I correct him, he was listening. Correct him and he was listening. Hmm. So they were just chastising their children for their own pleasure so that one day they can stand on the TV and do a speech and say, wow, this is my daughter, this is my child. But God, he is for our profit. He does not want to give a speech on TV and say, oh, this, this one, he did. No, no, no. It, he chastises us for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. He just wants us to do what is right for our benefit. Now, right now, we understand that no chastening for the present seems to be joyous. Nobody wants to be corrected, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised, uh, exercised thereby. You see the point? So when you're being punished, when you're being corrected, nobody really enjoys to be corrected. Nobody really enjoys being corrected. Everybody says, I don't want to be corrected. I know it. I can do it my way. Why are you beating me? Why are you passing me through all this? Why are you telling me to? <laughs> I remember when you were young, my, my dad used to tell us, don't waste food. So when you put some food on the plate, just put what you can finish. So, you know, sometimes uh, we have this greediness when you're children and you want to pick a lot for yourself. So we used to put a lot of food and then you just eat a little and then you're full. And, and uh, you, you, you pick the bones and everything, you put them back to the plate. And, and my dad will come and say, remove those bones and eat everything. Remove those. But they are dirty. No, put them on the table and eat everything. Eat everything. I want you to learn that food should not be wasted. That time when I'm eating and just doing, removing the bones and you say, ah, I'm eating what I just put on the table, the dirty stuff. And I'm That time it seems so bad. Because at the present time, chastisement doesn't seem so joyous, but it seems grievous. Nevertheless, later it yields a lot of fruit. Later on, you start noticing now when you're old, you have your own family and you can say, wasting food is not good because food is expensive. Things you should give to the poor if you have more. You should not spoil, you should not waste. And now you can understand because that time you could not understand. That's the same way the Bible says that the law was brought so that it could correct us for a little while before the promise came to those it was promised to. Because if there was no law, then the promise, even if the promise comes and it's, it's free, uh, how could it reach to the people? They could have killed themselves and killed one another. That's why the law had be, been brought, do not kill, do not lie, do not do this, do not do this. So the, the, the law could protect people for a while. You see the point? That's why the Bible also says that we as children, we as children of God, we, we, we are kept as... As the, in the same level as servants for a time until we grow up, until the inheritance comes fully to us on the due day. 
All right? Remember the woman caught in adultery who was brought to Jesus in in the in the in the Bible in the book of John 8? Rather than condemning her, Jesus offered her forgiveness. He said in John 8 verse 11. John 8 verse 11. Look at the words of Jesus. He did not condemn her. He did not say, oh woman, now you have been caught. It is all up to you. Look, look at this. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. You see? So he set her free. Not with a, a cut blanche. Like we, we, may, we may use that word to continue to sin. He did not tell you, okay, this is a free check. Go and sin. No, he told her, go. I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. He didn't give her a blank check to go and add sins the way she wants. But he told her, go, but sin no more. It was a command from sinning. All right. In other words, her future sins had not been automatically forgiven, the sins of the flesh. But if it was about the salvation, of course, that time Jesus had not died. But she was told, go and don't sin no more. Meaning that there are sometimes she will find herself sinning in the flesh. But she was told, please go and sin no more. Don't do these things again. I know you might have trials. You might have desires to do these things. But go and don't do them. Because your flesh will be, will be fighting wanting to do those wrong things. So friends, I believe that you have understood the two parts, the two natures of man. The two natures of man, which is this, the body of the sins of the flesh and the spirit and the soul. These are two different things. One cannot sin completely. The other one can sin absolutely and can sin so bad that it can just, God can just say, my son, you, you are an embarrassment to me. Just come over. Come over. Come over. Just let him die and come. You can sin so much until God just allows you to die. Do you want me to prove it to you? Look at 1 Corinthians. Let me just finish up with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. Look at this believer who was full of sin until God just decides, ah, 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 you let, let him just die and come. Look at what Paul is saying here. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. These are believers. He's talking to the church of Corinth. It was full of, you know, fornication in the church. And such fornication is not as much as named among the Gentiles. It is too much, more than even the worldly people, that one should have his father's wife. This is incest, which was being practiced by the believers. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned. You members in the church, you have not even mourned about this. It is just there puffed up. That he that has done this deed might be taken away from among you. We don't want him to infect other church members with that kind of uh, ideas. And just the same way with your children in the house, you tell them, hey, don't, don't bring those kind of styles of living in my house here please i want you to go close yourself in the bedroom and change change from those things we don't want to see your your, your kind of ideas here you will mess up the other children you see that that's the kind of because when he's with others he's going to in, in affect them with his style of life and paul says for i verily as absent in the body he was not there with them but present in spirit, because we are one in the spirit of Christ, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has done this deed. I'm giving my verdict here because as the spirit of God leads me. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together and, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, listen to what the verdict was here. To this believer who is a fornicator, to deliver such one unto Satan. For the destruction of what? The flesh. That the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. You see, 
I pray to God that this person who is messing up this congregation with his immoralities and these things, I pray that his, his flesh be, 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 be given, delivered unto Satan. Something happens and Satan destroys his flesh. But his spirit will be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus because he cannot lose his salvation. You see, these are two natures. The flesh can make many people do evil things until God just says, okay, you have, you have adhered, you have heeded to the flesh so much, eh? you, you're giving a bad testimony to me. And God says, uh -uh, uh -uh, son, come, 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 come. A road accident. You were drunk or you're something or you're, you, you're, you're fornicating and you got sick and you died and, and God is like, come, 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 my son. This, this is not the testimony I left you here on earth. You got saved to leave a good testimony for me, but you're not doing the way it's supposed to be. You just come. You just come. Leave the others. Let them work. You, you have wasted you, your rewards. You're not going to have them. Because now you don't want to work for your rewards. You're just sitting down doing and spoiling my name. God bless you. Have hope you had a good time. God bless you. Bless others. Bless others as well. <laughs>